Assalamu alaikum fam. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. We are in the seventh article and it is titled, Whether God is Altogether Simple. Okay, let's begin. Objection 1. It seems that God is not altogether simple. For whatever is from God must imitate him. Now this is interesting how he's contending this naysayer or the objectionist that whatever comes from God must imitate him getting at this sort of essence that is within in everything in creation that shows a sign of the maker thus from the first being are all beings we can follow that and from the first good is all good but in the things which God has made nothing is altogether simple therefore neither is God altogether simple now, this is really interesting because we're going to have to get into what does it mean to be <clears throat> simple. And it's true, things may appear to be simple, but they are indeed very complex. Like the veins, your nervous system, your digestive system. You know, it is quite intense. So we'll go that subjection once. We'll go to reply to that, which is over here. Whatever is from God imitates him. This is Aquinas speaking. As caused things imitate the first cause. Caused things imitating the first cause. So if a ball hits a ball, there's a movement of rolling there. But I would wonder if you would say, well, the axe that chops down the tree was force, but the tree falls in a different way. So this could be looked at in multiple ways, right? But I guess if you're going to use the match in a forest fire, the f the big fire came from the small fire. So there's simple ways you can compare that analogy. But it is of the essence of a thing to be in some sort composite. Exactly. So the essence of a thing. So remember how he said, from the first being are all beings. And so he got at to, well, basically to explain this, the imitation, right? So the essence is a degree of the imitation, right? Because at least its existence differs from its essence. Now, this is another unique aspect, right? How you exist, that's going to be different than your essence. Because you exist, but maybe not everything about you is shown. Because the essence sometimes can appear to be hidden, only revealed to a certain degree. And the way you exist is... A sort of external phenomenon, whereas the essence can be both internal and external, I'd argue, as will be shown hereafter. Now we go over to objection two. Further, whatever is best must be attributed to God, but with us that which is composite is better than that which is simple. So here, what is best must be attributed to God. As a Muslim, I would say both the good and bad all come from Allah. So it's whatever Allah has permitted. It's your color. It's your destiny. Right? And you can have something good and bad. But here you see the different angle of a Catholic perspective. Which is why it's important to read these scholars. Because not only do you learn their view, but you learn how yours is different. But with us, that which is composite is better than that which is simple. Thus, chemical compounds are better than simple elements, and animals than the parts that compose them. This is interesting because it's like a jellyfish versus an octopus kind of analogy I, I get in my head. Therefore, it cannot be said that God is altogether simple. Hmm. It's really interesting, this word simple, because you start to wonder, like, Hmm, well, obviously, God must be above the human understanding. Humans can understand very complex things like mathematics, but we are indeed limited. And I don't think God would be simple in that way. Because when you use the word simple in English, it defines pure in essence, yet oneness, yet like... Lacking complexity at the same time. So it's very interesting the way in which your mind can grapple with the word simple, right? Objection, the reply to exception two. With us composite things are better than simple things. 
because the perfections of created goodness cannot be found in one simple thing, but in many things. So notice this. The perfections of created goodness are found in many things. Mm. So you can find multiple things of good in many things in creation, not just one good. That's a good point. Flavor, for example, that's an essence of good. It's simple. Flavor is simple, yet it's found in many things. But the perfection of divine goodness is found in one simple thing. Mm. This is interesting. Let's see how he takes it. So now he's going to go into his longer response. On the contrary, Augustine says, God is truly and absolutely simple. Mm. St. Augustine, we read some of him today. So we got Augustine saying that it is simple. Absolute, to me, doesn't automatically mean simple. It can mean complex. But I think it comes down to decision, right? The yes or no is a simple yes or no right? So whether God permits it or does not, the decree can be simple, but the ripple effect after can be complex. This is really interesting the way you think about it. Now Aquinas is going to answer. I answer that the absolute simplicity of God may be shown in many ways. First, from the previous articles of this question, for there is neither composition of quantitative parts in God. So there is no format like gene of every single thing uh, that can be quantified of God so you cannot quantify the parts of God so he's saying you cannot uh, really define or show the measuring of God because you're not able to gather up those quantitative data points since he is not a body exactly so God is not a body, and when you have a body, you can quantify it. You can analyze its composition. You can't do that with God. You can only look at signs. Nor composition of form and matter. So here he says again, God is not a body, God does not have form, and God is not of matter. Nor does his nature differ from his suppositum, nor his essence from his existence. Now, this is interesting because this is just really, really mind-blowing. Does God, does God's existence differ from his essence? This is a, for us humans, it's, you can get at that question. But if you know God exists, you look at the signs and you see the essence of God in that. So... This is really a puzzling question. Neither is there in him composition of genus. Remember he got into that earlier? Because God is his own category, he is, there is no genus of him. So if you have the genus canine, there's a chihuahua, there's a dutch hound, there's a roddy, right? The genus, but God is not a genus because there's no such thing as polytheism, you follow? And difference. So his composition isn't different, he's getting at. So if he's going to say here for us that the composition of God, there is no difference, that would then mean simplicity. Do you see how he's lining that up there? So his definition of simple here is very relevant. Nor of subject and accident. Therefore it is clear that God is no wise composite, but is altogether simple. Mm. So Aquinas contends that God is simple in terms of uh, not being this composite being because if he's composite he belongs to a genus has difference and then he's put into the realm of composition which then leads to quantitative things which would then mean a human can sum up god very interesting uh, logical flow here going on secondly because every part is posterior to its component parts and is dependent on them so a composite he says has a posterior there's something behind it right so, if God is the first cause, God therefore cannot be a composite because that would mean something is behind God when God is the first cause. You see, just in this few sentence, Aquinas is staying loyal to his statement in the previous section. That's how you know you have a consistent scholar, is that he's not making up things, he's going on the same string of reasoning. 
in a logical sense, sticking to his theology. It is quite interesting, his writing. But God is the first being, exactly, you see, as shown above. Question 2, Article 3. Thirdly, because every composite has a cause, for things in themselves different cannot unite unless something causes them to unite. So notice here. Composite has a cause. Well, that composite, there's these different moving parts. They can unite when something causes them to unite. But he's, remember he said that God is the first cause. So nothing is going to make God divided. So he will never need to be united because God is one. So he's getting at the simplicity of a numerical figure here mathematically. But God is uncaused. So here again, he reiterates his point. God is uncaused because he's the first cause. And he doesn't need to have a composite form, he's arguing, because he doesn't need to be united because he is united. He's the one who unites. As shown above, since he is the first efficient cause. Fourthly, because in every composite there must be be potentiality again do you remember his potentiality point he contended that god does not have potentiality because potentiality means you're lacking something you're moving towards a finite goal right you haven't fully come to completion when god is absolute if you're absolute you lack nothing you need nothing so potentiality is not in something absolute he's really keeping it clear here and actuality exactly so remember the points here potentiality and actuality so god he does not have actuality in potentiality, and therefore he's not composite, because what is composite has actuality and potentiality in it. And this is more to his key points here. But this does not apply to God, for either one of the parts actuates another. Okay, so here, what do you need to get at? If you're composite, and you got a potential to actualize, you have another part that is causing that. That would not apply to God because God is the first cause. Remember? He, he is the efficient cause. Because he's not lacking in anything. He's the mover. Or at least all the parts are potential to the whole. See all, all see that? Remember how he all parts are potential to the whole? That's part of the composite. These different parts. These composite parts moving to unite to the whole. Whereas God doesn't need to be united because God is one. Here. Fifthly, because nothing composite can be prefacated of any single one of its parts. And this is evident in a whole made up of the dissimilar parts. For no part of a man is a man. This is a very cool point. I'd say that his... Okay, this is maybe different, but... I think you get into a philosophical point here. So when he says no part of a man is a man, I'd say you're a man if you have, um, you know, your male organ, your biology. But what he means, like, if you're lacking a foot, doesn't mean you're not a man. If you point to your thumb, that isn't something that makes you a man. But there are some anthropologists who say because humans have ex uh, opposable thumbs, that it makes them more unique. And because they're bipedal and their bone structure, that makes them a man. So how the evolutionary peeps define a human a homo sapien compared to the other anthropological type of things is quite interesting so this is a very deep question here what makes man a man he is arguing that no part of a man makes a man a man but he also does mean humans in general some might take up this point as a literal thing like well what makes a woman a woman a man a man we're getting in that today but he is pointing at something deeper here nor any of the parts of the foot a foot now, this is interesting because all the parts that make up the foot are the foot, right? The ankle, your uh, toes, your toenails, all the bones and joints, the cartilage, everything in your foot. All of those parts make up, are the composite parts that make up the whole. The whole is your foot. The toe is part of the whole. That's the composite part. So he's saying that that's an example of composition here. But in holes made up of similar parts... Although something which is predicated of the whole may be predicated of a part. Predicated of a whole, predicated of a part. Follow that. As part of the air is air, and a part of water, water. Nevertheless, certain things are predictable of the whole, which, this is very interesting, predictable of the whole, which cannot be predicated of any of the parts. Okay, so, you can predict some things on the whole, and others on the parts, and some not, vice versa. 
For the instance, if the whole volume of water is two cubits, no part of it can be two cubits. <laughs> Clever, right? Because the whole measurement, right? You got one gallon of milk. I take out a tablespoon. That tablespoon is not the gallon. Thus, in every composite, there is something which is not itself. This is interesting. Do you hear what he just said? In every composite, there is something which is not itself. Very, very astute. But even if this could be said of whatever has a form, that is, it has something which is not itself, as in white object, there is something which does not belong to the essence of white. Mmm, this is a clever one. Okay, you have the white. There can be something in that white that isn't white. You follow? Nevertheless, in the form itself, there is nothing besides itself. And so, since God is absolute form, again, God is absolute form, so he's arguing God is simple because he's absolute. And he contends that God is not part of this composite, because to have a composite form would degrade from his first efficient cause, essentially. Or, rather, absolute being. He can be in no way composite. Hillary implies this argument when he says... God, who is strength, is not made up of things that are weak, nor is he who is light composed of things that are dim. That is very interesting. Many dim things can make one whole light. Many weak things can make something strong. There's a bundle of sticks can make a strong uh, fasci, right? A one twig by itself will snap, but a bundle of twigs won't. This is interesting. So it's a very unique yet poetic way to explain why God cannot be composed of composite parts because if you took away one of those composite parts, it would lack from the whole and God can't lack anything, therefore he cannot be of composite and therefore he's absolute. If he's absolute, he's a simple nature. Uh, this is quite uh, interesting. So, man, very nerdy. He has kept up his logic the whole way. Very mind-blowing. No wonder why his name has lived on for, you know, hundreds of years, studied across the world. His works have been the foundation of Catholicism. If any person wants to take on Christianity with a serious scholar, not just someone who's walking about in the street, you should understand and comprehend and accurately uh, attack the arguments instead of the character of the person, right? I hope to one day write a very systematic uh, book like this uh, with Islam. It is quite an extensive work. The person who has translated it, the person who has written this down, they have done an immense work to humanity for those for us students of theology. And everything he talks about can make us think. That's one of the benefits. Aquinas is studied in philosophy. He's a common household name. If you get around a serious Catholic, they will mention him. And they used to make the uh, Catholic students study him, but they've lacked in that. And, you know, this has led to the degradation of them. And it, maybe the world would be better if Catholics actually spent more time reading and not submitting to liberalism, right? So, again, this is a very profound book. That was the seventh article, question three. Whether God is altogether simple. So this is Aquinas answered yes. But remember it was concerning ed essence, absolute form, absolute being, first cause, efficient cause. The very unique language that he uses that people use and they don't even realize it. So uh, hope you learned something. I certainly know I did. And he gave us the insight that Augustine, St. Augustine, who we read today on my Bibliophile Hermit channel, also contends that uh, God is truly an absolute symbol. Uh, very interesting. So hopefully you can uh, nerd out even more on your own.